Welcome to worship at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. If you want to know more about our church here in Cincinnati, we encourage you to click the link to our website. But for now, settle in, take a deep breath, and prepare your heart for worship as we begin with contemplative music. Washington Presbyterian Church, this is a glorious day. The light and the joy of Jesus is surrounding us. Whatever the darkness you are experiencing or the shadows in your life, know that God is here with us, surrounding us, enlivening us, healing us, warming and touching our souls. So let us join in song and in celebration as we sing this first hymn, Jesus, Light of Joy. Jesus, Light of Joy, surround us. Let your splendid glory shine, source of every earthly blessing, heaven's everlasting sign. Alleluia, alleluia, we adore you, light divine. Now the shadows fall around us, now the evening has begun. Still your gracious light is with us, brighter than the morning sun. Alleluia, alleluia, God of glory three in one. With the saints we lift our voices, God of power, God of might, still your gracious light is with us, singing praises day and night. Alleluia, alleluia, holy, holy, holy one. 
Join me in the prayer of confession. Dear loving Creator, we confess that we make excuses for our lack of faith, for being selfish and apathetic rather than letting ourselves be enlightened. We find ways to pass up opportunities to serve and to witness in your name, claiming that we are too small or unqualified to be useful and effective. Like Zacchaeus, help us to lose our fear and to step outside our comfort zone, to do things differently and to seek Christ in our lives. Help us to start anew, to make amends and to open our hearts to your forgiving spirit so that we can be effective in sharing your love and compassion. Amen. You have always been loved by God. Know that you are healed and forgiven. If Zacchaeus can change, then anyone can. Oh, the Savior's arms are open and you're welcome in. Oh, the Savior's arms are open and you're welcome in. Amen. Now this here is the story of a cowboy named Zacchaeus, the rootinest, tootinest robber west of the Jordan River. Zacchaeus, see, was a mean little man. He had no friends. No one could stand a yellow-bellied rascal of his ilk. He stole from the poor a little at a time, said, I'll take yours, now yours is mine, a cowardly thief as sour as curdled milk. Well, one day Jesus rode into town, and who do you think was wearing a frown but old Zacchaeus, too short to see the Lord. So he scrambled up a gnarled old tree till he's high enough up to see, and Jesus spotted him, and he might have said these words. How do, Zacchaeus, how could you help but see us from your perch up in them branches of that sycamore tree? Well, I was headed fishing, but now I've got a mission, a mission for to save you and to set you free. Do -do 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 -do. Zacchaeus turned as white as cotton, thinking I may have just forgotten that if I can see Jesus, he can see me. 
Well, the whole town's here and I'm on the spot. Guess I'd better answer, like it or not. But before he could, Jesus spoke again toward the tree. And he said, How now, Zacchaeus, can you guarantee us that we'll be eating supper at your table tonight? If you've got beans and cornbread, we will all leave well fed. But I'll be serving you, friend, from God's words of life. Zacchaeus had the Lord out to his ranch just as soon as he hopped down from that branch and something about that day changed his heart. He said, I know I cheated and I know I stole, but Jesus' friendship saved my soul. So my thieving days are over. It's a brand new start. And I've got one more thing to say. The money I took, I'll give it away and pay back every person that I gypped. And just to make amends and such, I'll pay him back four times as much. You could look at Jesus and see his heart was gripped. And he said, oh my Zacchaeus, the devil man will flee us when we make a good confession like you done here today. Now no more guilt and shame, for that is why I came to find the lost and save them and to show the way. See how Zacchaeus only God can free us from a heart of evil and a life of sin. Ransom from tarnation, that's what I call salvation. The Savior's arms are open and you're welcome in. Well, the story, friend, is cut and dried and dipped in flour and chicken fried. It's the tenderest truth delivered unto man. When Jesus comes and talks to you, well, you're in for an alteration too. If Zacchaeus can change, anybody can. Oh, the Savior's arms are open and you're welcome in. Oh, the Savior's arms are open and you're welcome in. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house tonight. So Zacchaeus hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone or anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. Amen. <laughs> the word of God for the people of God. Today we're continuing in our sermon series on unlikely heroes. Already we've seen two people in this series who've done remarkable things, unexpected things. A little child who by no means of a definition was been considered a hero of his day and yet generously gives out of his lunch and eventually helps facilitate the feeding of 5,000 people. Or what about last week's Queen Esther, who, though having a title of power, really had no real power at all and risks it all to save the Jewish people. And so today, as you've probably been listening in the service, we're talking about the person of Zacchaeus. And when we see the story at first blush, we're not really quite sure how he fits into the unlikely heroes situation. I mean, the hero of the story is really Jesus in this story, isn't it? Jesus is the one who extends grace to Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus responds. But I want to talk about this unlikely hero because I think oftentimes we need to become unlikely heroes in our own lives. We are called to take courageous action that actually changes us. And when we're talking about unlikely heroes, sometimes those heroes facilitate great change for the community around them, but that sometimes an unlikely hero is something that 
is in our own lives, who we are, that forces us to do something that actually changes ourselves to be more like Christ. Well, let's think about this story of Zacchaeus. I mean, of course, most of us grew, grew up knowing that little song, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. You know, we, we know the nursery st story and we've heard it before. It's, the story's in the lectionary. So many of us who have been Presbyterians have probably heard this passage preached on a lot. And it is a delightful story of redemption and of, of wonderful things that are going on. But I want to place it in a little different context today in our unlikely hero story. And I want to think about the story from a different point of view, perhaps, than you've heard before. I think it's important that we look at the nature of tax collectors in the ancient world. You know this fact, I'm sure, that tax collectors were sort of the bad guys of every story in the life of the ancient Israelites. They were people who were proxies of the Romans who collected taxes. And in order to make wealth or their cut, they often, often leveled what was the baseline tax, even greater taxes on the people. And the really scary thing was they had the backing of Rome behind them. So many times these were people within the community, Jewish people, who took advantage of the system. They were working for the Roman government and then were engaging in oppressive and economically devastating practices against their own people. And so they had the ability to grow quite rich because they could level whatever surcharge they wanted on top of those taxes. And they were often ostracized, vilified. They were not popular in any sense of the word. And it says in this story that Zacchaeus wasn't simply a tax collector. He was also the chief of the tax collectors, which meant he was taking probably a percentage over all of the tax collectors in the region. And we don't, well, we don't really know how extensive his sort of network or his sales area or tax collecting area would have been, so to speak we know that it was very unlikely that he was popular. In fact, in previous stories, when Jesus is telling a parable or an illustration, he will often use the words, a sinner and tax collectors. This was just sort of this group. If you, you were a sinner, you were already bad in the eyes of the religious elite or the people around you. But if you were a tax collector, that was like putting an emphasis on the point. These were really the most despicable people to the Jewish people because they economically oppressed them. More than likely, they lorded and displayed their wealth for all to see, and they were co-conspirators with the Roman government. So it's sort of a surprise in this story when we see that Jesus, when he encounters Zacchaeus, who has climbed up this tree, extends hospitality to him. Although we've seen Jesus do this before, and Jesus has always been a friend of sinners and even tax collectors. You remember that the disciple Matthew was a tax collector who left everything behind and followed Jesus. So when we look at this story and we see sort of the context of how Zacchaeus would have been perceived by the people around him, I think for my purposes today and seeing him as an unlikely hero, I want to talk about how Zacchaeus may have seen himself. You see, just a few chapters earlier in the book of Luke, Luke talks about uh, the contrast between a tax collector and a Pharisee who are praying inside the temple. And he contrasts that the Pharisee is full of self-righteousness and thinks God is basically lucky to have such a righteous man as the Pharisee in his midst. But Jesus contrasts this with a tax collector who is praying in the temple. And while praying in the temple, the, the tax collector puts his head down and, and can't even look up. He's so filled with shame. He's filled with this angst of how he has not only betrayed the people of God, but betrayed God himself. And the shame that he feels for the way that he's compromised in his life is so overwhelming that in the space of the ancient temple and the ancient city of Jerusalem, as he comes and he sees the magnificence of the temple courts and perhaps watches the priests or the, the giving sacrifices and the people praying and are fervently far more righteous than this tax collector. He's filled with shame about who he is and what he has done. 
It's reasonable to expect that Zacchaeus may have felt the same way. That whatever the wealth that he experienced, whatever power he gained or whatever protection he even enjoyed from the Roman government, it's very likely that Zacchaeus also shared a deep sense of shame about who he was. He shared a shame about the guilt that he felt for having exploited and defrauded the Jewish people. It's probably and very likely part of the motivation why Zacchaeus is curious about this Jesus person. So curious that a man who would have instilled fear among the masses chooses not to go out among the people in the crowd, even though he very likely could have commanded somewhat of a military presence. He could have split the crowd wide open, could have come before Jesus as a, as a person of great power, of great wealth, of great status, with a full weight of room behind him. And yet he chooses not to do that. It says being small in stature, he, he actually climbs up a tree. In a very humiliating posture for a man who held such wealth and status within the district. He climbs a tree just, just to get a glimpse of Jesus. There's something within him that's motivating him to think that perhaps Jesus could be the one who would extend grace to him. Remember, I mentioned Matthew way up in Galilee, the tax collector that becomes one of Jesus' disciples. Well, Matthew or Levi, very likely the friendship circles that he had were very likely just other tax collectors. They were so despised and vilified in that day. It's very likely that Zacchaeus in Jericho had heard the story of what happened to Matthew. Perhaps other tax collectors or other people that he knew had heard Jesus speak in, even about this parable about the tax collector in the uh, temple court. The word somehow had gotten back to Zacchaeus. Could this be the one who helps me find a sense of grace or peace or transformation? Is there some way that his life can be redeemed? And so we see Zacchaeus, he's, he's perched up in a tree. He's climbed a tree and he's perched up there and he's probably holding onto the branches and looking over and wanting to see Jesus. He wants to hear for himself this message of grace and inclusion that Jesus has spoken about. And to his surprise, Jesus not only sees him, but signals him out. And in an in a unbelievable uh, action, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. I'm going to share fellowship with you. In other words, that process of restoration, of, of healing begins with Jesus' extension of non-judgmental of embrace of Zacchaeus. Now, why is Zacchaeus an unlikely hero in this story? The reason I say that is because I think all of us have some degree of shame or guilt in our lives. All of us have something that we hold as a secret. Not any of us have ever been perfect. There may be a secret guilt about something you've done. It could be one incident or it could be a pattern of incidents. I could name a whole lot of things and it would probably hit many of you on the target. But there's also this sense that many of us share a sense of shame that, that, that there's something fundamentally wrong with who we are. And sometimes we have a difficulty within our lives of thinking I've done a monstrous thing and then saying I'm actually a monster. And sometimes we feel that so deeply within us that it, it cripples us. We hide it. We defend against it. We, we create a barrier so that no one can see the secret sin. And we often will project a view of ourselves out to the world to, to try and mitigate that sense of shame that we have. It can be crippling because no matter how many defensive shields you put up, in those wee quiet hours of the night, we know the truth, and the truth is difficult to face. But then there are things that happen in our lives, particularly around the issues of shame, 
that may have nothing to do with who we think we are, but they become the internalized shade because society has told us that we are wrong, not enough, not good enough. This certainly happens within the LGBTQIA uh, community where there becomes this sense of internalized homophobia that oftentimes people um, experience because the society has told them there is something fundamentally wrong with who they are. And even after they come out, even after they maybe even are in long-term partnerships or are living a full and rich life, there can be that lingering space within their being that somehow feels like I'm not normal, I'm not right. Those messages that came very early from family or from the greater society. That's true even in our discussions as we've been learning in our 21 day racial equity challenge where oftentimes people of color actually have an internalized sense of shame of being non-white. It's not because they themselves uh, have done something wrong in their, their color or their ethnic or their, even the religious background that they come from, but that society or others have told them that they are less than. And that sense of shame that has been imposed on them in the, the narratives or their exclusion from the significant stories that we tell in this country through movies or books or other places, they begin to weigh and say, I'm not quite good enough. You see this oftentimes when people in the black community talk about the gradations of color of skin that somehow the darker you are, that's less desirable, but the lighter your skin, the better you are. In other words, I'm moving more towards that white standard. And that sense of internalized shame for, for something you've not done, for something you are not even responsible for, it becomes an internalized sense of racism towards themselves. And certainly for Zacchaeus in this story, his role as a tax collector and the chief tax collector, there's things that he's done that are despicable and wrong. There's also his own sense of shame that's related to that guilt. But there's certainly coupled on top of that is the compounding factor of how often he was judged and pushed down, vilified, hated, marginalized. So much so that even an individual tax collector was collectively seen as as evil as every other one. You see, Zacchaeus had a deep sense of shame and guilt in his life. So how is Zacchaeus an unlikely hero in this story then? Well, you see, I think just like Zacchaeus, whether we're dealing with guilt, a sense of shame, a shame that may come at us because of our behavior or a shame that is imposed on us from the outside. One of the most courageous things we can do is confront that guilt and that shame. You see, we don't believe as Christians that until we tell the truth about what we've done and how we see ourselves that God's grace can't break in and and do that transformative work that grace is supposed to do. And in the case of Zacchaeus, he confronts what he's done. We, we see it by his response to Jesus when he says he will restore and, and he will restore anybody that he's done ill will toward, that he's defrauded in any way. He'll he restore them not to the biblical minimum of you know, the, the initial wrong plus, say, 10 or 20% surcharge, so to speak. He says, I'll give four times. I will restore them four times. I'm going to go over and above. He recognizes the wrong that he's done. Or in the sense that he says, I'll give away half of my wealth to the poor. That sense of shame is that he's confronted that there are things that he's done and a system that he's a part of that has really wreaked havoc on the most vulnerable in society. You see, a courageous hero, an unlikely hero, must be a courageous hero. They must be someone who's willing to take stock of themselves, to look themselves honestly in the face, to take responsibility for the things that they've done wrong, 
but then also to confront that bigger and more complex issue of the shame that they feel. Now the challenge is, is that oftentimes we, we take a quicker glancing when that, that little sort of guilt genie comes out of the box or the, the shame monster sort of rears its head. We often will uh, look at that for just briefly or just for a few moments. But oftentimes in America, it seems like often we do one or two things. We either really diminish it, we try to explain away our guilt, or get defensive or hostile in light of our shame. Or we go the other side and we then create and uh, catastrophize what we've done. We, we overstate it. We, we feel the shame at such a deep level that it can be debilitating. People who feel and are on that end of the spectrum often feel deep depression or a sense of, par they're paralyzed by that sense of guilt or shame that they feel. And those who sort of uh, diminish or defend or try to minimize their guilt and shame often become cavalier and, and lack really the ability to have empathy for the pain of others. But what the gospel calls us to do in story after story, including this one and many others, so the gospel calls us to have a good, a right, a, a, a perspective that is honest and true, but doesn't tip to being uh, defensive or minimizing of what we've done or how we feel. And it also calls us not to over-catastrophize how we feel and what we've done. Because it's in that straight and honest reckoning that we have. Looking at ourselves in the mirror, saying, I've done this very bad thing and now I need to bring some kind of restitution, I need to bring a reconciliation, I need to do some kind of restorative action to make it right, it means that we must look at it straight in the face and then we're able to see what the right, right action is. And the same thing is true of the shame. Sometimes there's a kernel of truth within that shame and we have to confront it and in confronting it honestly, we allow God's grace to break in. And sometimes when we confront that shame, we have to say, no, the basis of my shame, for example, an internalized sense of racism or an internalized sense of, of homophobia, those things need to be named as not the thing I'm supposed to carry. That is not true. We actually confront it as a lie. But when we can confront that, we become an unlikely hero to ourselves. The courage that it takes to be brutally honest, to put our broken nature and our broken actions, our, our distorted attitudes right in front of Jesus. To speak it honestly, to be willing to look at it for all of its consequences, whether those are negative consequences to other people or to ourselves, then invites us to receive Christ's forgiveness, Christ's hospitality, Christ's welcome, as Jesus does in this story. And then it frees us to know how we might do that restorative action, how we might live not into shame, but into our value as God's beloved. It will help us and guide us to know what is the correct restorative thing that we're called to do. And we see that in full display in Zacchaeus' life.
Holy God, we know you are powerful, eternal, and all-knowing. We know you are patient, just, and rich in mercy. We are reminded to trust in you, even when things are difficult. We are called on to not remain silent when we see oppression. And we know that even when we have fallen short, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. We celebrate your mercy and are thankful for the ability to stay still connected with our congregation in these difficult times. Some of us are scared for our health or for the health of those we love. Some of us are facing uncertain financial futures or strained relationships. Some of us are saddened or angered or both at the examples of social injustice we see around us. We bring all of these challenges, as well as many others left unsaid, to you in prayer. We pray for the staff, volunteers, and officers of this congregation as they seek to share your word and maintain community while keeping everyone safe. We pray for our political leaders as they seek to navigate the many difficult challenges facing our country. We ask that they give them all wisdom and strength. We pray for our healthcare workers caring for the sick, and we pray for the children and teachers who will be returning to school in the next several weeks. We ask for their strength and health in the next coming months. We pray for those who are suffering due to conflicts around the world and for the victims of the tragedy in Beirut. We ask for peace in their lands and for the support of the international community. We pray for those who are suffering injustices and oppression in this community and around the world. We ask that they know your love and peace. Give us all the vision to see the path you lay before us and the strength to walk it. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Our Father Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom kingdom come, come, your will be done, done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Mount Washington filled and surrounded with joy. Take some time this week and perhaps do a little journaling, go for a long walk, do that courageous work of being an unlikely hero to yourself. Look at those areas of secret sin and debilitating shame. Look them straight in the face. Be honest about them. Bring those into the presence of Jesus and allow Jesus' grace to be healing. And once you experience that healing, that deeper healing, that more transformative healing, 
hear the invitation from God of what you might do to restore the places in your life that need God's reconciling love. So go out, be joyful, be honest, and be healed. Amen. Debbie Whaley, and I'm the pastor here at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. We're so delighted that you joined us for worship. If you're interested in finding out more about our ministries or even contributing to our ministries, check us out on the web at mwpc-church.org. Have a great week.